Chatus Loki Bhagavatam, and we discussed the first verses, but today we're going to discuss the fourth verse. Okay, we can say it together. Etavad eva jigyasyam tatva jigyasunatmana anvaya vyatirekabhyam yat syat sarvatra sarvada. Okay, this means etavad eva jigyasyam. Jigyasa means you should inquire. Tattva Jigyasunatmana, about the Tattva, the absolute truth. And you should become a student, Jigyasunatmana. A student means someone who is inquiring from the teacher. If you are a student, but you don't have an inquisitive nature, then you will not absorb any of the knowledge given by your teachers. You'll just be like a rock in a river that all the water is flowing over, but you don't absorb anything. So if we're inquisitive and eager to learn the truth, then we'll become like a sponge and we can absorb the wisdom given from our gurus. Okay, so this is called Jigyasunatmanaha. We should become inquisitive. Atato Brahma Jigyasaha. Try to inquire into the Absolute. Anvaya Vyatarekabhyam. Anvaya means, Anvaya Vyatarekabhyam means both directly and indirectly. The Mayavadis, what they teach is first, Neti Neti Neti. Neti means, I am not this, I am not that. So when you're inquiring into the nature of the self, first you have to, there's indirect and direct methods. So the indirect method is, what I am not. And this is called the process of neti. So at first to understand what is the real nature of the self, it's not so easy to understand. So first we can understand by saying, I am not this. Like, everyone can do that. Like, I am not this bench. I am not this phone. I am not this microphone. I am not Abhidham, but maybe, I don't know. I am not his glass. So this is called Neti Neti, I am not that. That's indirect method. But then we also need the direct method. If we only follow the indirect method, but not the direct method, then the Mayavadis say what happens is, it's like you take a cabbage and you peel off one leaf and then another leaf and then another leaf all the way to the bottom thinking, I'll find the true nature of the self. It's not this. It's not this, it's not this. And you take off one leaf after another, and in the middle, ultimately, you find nothing. And then you think, I am nothing. I have achieved self-knowledge. This is when you follow the Mayavadi path, which is only neti neti, I'm not this, I'm not this. So we don't just follow that path, we follow the positive path. And this is achieved through taking shelter of those who are themselves realized in the absolute truth. In the Bhagavad Gita 4.34, there's a very important verse that describes the nature of the student and how he approaches Guru. Those who are realized in the absolute truth will bestow that knowledge upon you if you approach them sincerely, submissively, with an inquisitive spirit, and you render service. So that's how you approach Guru. There's a verse in the Upanishads, if you want to understand the absolute truth, approach Guru with the wood of, for sacrifice in your hand, which means you approach them ready to serve with submissiveness and inquisitiveness. Okay, so we'll learn an interesting story about this. So in the last line, yat syat sarvatra sarvada, it means we should search everywhere and at all times. Sarvatra, Sarvada. Sarvatra means everywhere. And Sarvada means in all circumstances. So if we really want to understand the truth, we must be ready to be seekers of the truth. Not just like occasionally. Like once in a while I'll chant and I'll think about my true nature. But this must become a passion that we are relentlessly pursuing self-knowledge. And therefore, there's a story given in the Chandogya Upanishad that's very fitting for this verse. The Chandogya Upanishad tells a story about once Lord Brahma, the first created being, the first son of God, who himself manifested the 14 planetary systems and all the created beings, the forms of those beings within it. So one time Brahma gave Harikata about the nature of the self. And he said, this self who we truly are. This is called the Atman. So the nature of the Atman is that if we realize that Atman, we become extremely powerful. 
So much so that all other beings will honor us and everything will come within our grasp. If we realize the nature of the self, then we can achieve everything. Sovereignty over the entire creation. We can become the next Brahma. We can get all power if we like. So he spoke like that. So then, who heard that? Who heard the lecture? Indra, many people heard. But who heard and took up desire to understand? Just hearing is not everything. So it said two people desired to understand this knowledge. Indra, the king of the demigods, and his rival, Virochana. Virochana was the king of the demons, but he is the father of Bali Maharaj. Generally, when we think Indra, his rival is Bali. But before Bali was Virochan. Virochan is the father of Bali, and he was the king of the demons. So at that time, Virochana and Indra heard this from Brahma, that if you understand the nature of the Atman, you become the most powerful personality, Everyone, everything will become at your fingertips. So what did they do? They both approached Lord Brahma submissively. They said, please accept us as your disciples. Let us stay in your Gurukul and we will train under you and we want to learn this divine knowledge. So Brahma said, okay. So they started staying in his ashram. It said that Brahma gave them the service of taking care of the cows. If you want to understand divine knowledge, the best way is to perform service to the cows because they are always serving everyone and they are very simple-hearted in the mode of goodness, sattva gun. So if you want to get divine knowledge, you need to rise above the mode of ignorance, tamagun and passion, rajagun, to the mode of sattva, purity and goodness, like cows. They're very simple, sweet-hearted, and they're always serving everyone. That's why we see in all gurukuls, you have cows that the students will serve. So it said they didn't just serve for a few days. Brahma said for 32 years, stay in the Gurukul and serve the cows. And at that time, you should be very serious. I don't want you to look even at your reflection in a mirror. Because we're so attached to our perceived self. If we want to understand our real self, we have to detach ourselves from the perceived self for some time. So when we look in a mirror, we think this is who I am. So he said, for 32 years, don't look at your reflection. And just serve the cows, take care of the ashram, and be very serious students. Also, you have to be brahmacharis. Perfectly celibate for 32 years. Before the sages, if you want to understand true knowledge, you have to become urdvareta. Urdvareta means you take all your energies and you rise them up to your brahmatal. Of the seven chakras, you rise up to the top chakra. And you take all that energy there and then you can understand anything. So you have to be brahmacharis. So it's not like you can just... Nowadays people say that, Oh, I stayed in the ashram, I learned everything for like 20 years and now I'm going to teach it to you in five minutes. And you don't have to go through the hard process. Just pay right here where my donation, my button is. Give me a thousand dollars and then you'll learn everything. But this is just cheating. You have to go through the process. Okay, so these Indra and Virochan, for 32 years they studied as brahmacharis in the Gurukul. 32 years. Finally, after 32 years, they had big long beards, long nails, like in Chaturmasya, we don't cut our hair, we don't cut our nails. So they came before Brahma with very long nails and hair and very ragged and unkempt because they hadn't put shampoo in their hair, they hadn't been bathing with nice soap. So they came in front of Brahma and offered Pranam and said, now it's been 32 years, please you should give us Atma Gyan, please teach us about the Atman. So Brahma said, okay, tomorrow morning come before me. So they came, sat down before him in the morning time and he said, now I will teach you the most secret of all kinds of knowledge. What is that? He said, go over to that pool, that pond. It's very nice and clear. And now I want you to look in the reflection. For 32 years, you haven't seen your reflection. Now go and look at yourself. So they walked over into the pool and they looked at themselves and they could barely recognize themselves. It had been so long. And they had these big long beards and nails and soiled. And also they were always in the sun. So they looked at themselves for a few minutes and then they came back to Brahma and sat down. And so Brahma smiled and he said, Now, I want you to go 
and cut your nails and shave your beards and trim your hair and wash with nice with soap and shampoo and everything and then come back again. So they went and cleaned themselves up very nicely thinking they were very happy because they had done a long austerity and now they were ready to get some sweet, you know, some special knowledge. So they came back nice and clean and then Brahma said, okay, go again and look in the pool. So they again looked at themselves and this time they were very fresh and clean and effulgent. Why were they so effulgent? Because for 32 years they had been doing this austerity. Said if you do 32 years of austerity, you become glowing and effulgent like the sun. Completely detached from the self and they're engaged in service to Guru. So they were very effulgent and they saw their reflection in the pool and it was like they were glowing. Because also Brahma had given their mercy by serving Guru. So they came back in front of Brahma and Brahma said, okay, you saw yourself. I said, yes. Okay, so now tell us what is the nature of the Atman? Anybody know what he said? Brahma said, that reflection that you saw in the pool, that is the Atman. That is the self. And knowing this, you'll get all power. So they were like thinking for a little bit. And he said, anything else? He said, no, this is, this is the Atman. So then they were both at first very happy and they both left some distance. Indra started going back to heaven and Virochan started going back to subterranean heaven. Said, Sutala Loka is where the demons live in complete bliss and ignorance at the same time. Ignorance is bliss. So Virochan went back immediately and he began to teach this idea. It's called Deha Atmavad. That I am this body and Brahma, he said, why did Brahma make me learn all this stuff? He said, you have to do austerities so that you'll become healthy, you'll be able to digest nicely, you can enjoy as much as you like. And just see, when I, looked, when I saw my reflection, I was so effulgent. And now the lesson that he gave me is that we should eat and enjoy and dance and be merry. It said, beg, borrow or steal. This is the philosophy he began to teach. And this is the philosophy that's taught throughout the world. In most schools, in most governments, whatever you can do, try to enjoy as much as possible. Any kind of religiosity is only to enhance your material position or your material prosperity and enjoyment. Dharma artha kam. That's the purpose of life, only enjoyment. And therefore, we see nowadays especially, this is the philosophy of the demons, materialism. And it said, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada said, 99.9% .9 of people follow this philosophy. Even if they say they believe in God, they follow this philosophy of materialism. And he said, this is the philosophy of the demons. So Virochan began to preach that. On the other hand, Indra, on his way back to heaven, he started to think, is this the absolute truth or not? He began to consider. He was a proper student. Jigyasunatma, he was very inquisitive. How can this body be the real self? I am now a nice and effulgent, but there are many other people who are sick, who are diseased, who are dying, who are born with horrible diseases. We see in Christianity, for example, they say, this body is the self. Even after you die, the body will be resurrected. And little babies, if they're born and they're, they die very young, uh, they never got baptized or they never took shelter of Christ, then they'll go to hell. Or like the Calvinists say, you'll go to hell eternally unless you take shelter of the one true religion. But they're still identifying with the body and very attached to this. Like the Mormons, they say, after we die, we'll go to heaven and we'll have our dog, we'll have our cat, we'll have our family and our garden and our nice lawn and our lawnmower and we'll live happily there forever. So this is one form of materialism also. And the Bhagavad Gita says we can go to heaven for some time like that, but again we must fall down when we exhaust our pious merits. So Indra went back to Brahma and said, Oh Brahma, please, is, I am confused about the nature of the self. Please give me some further instruction. So he said, if you want to learn further, then again you have to do 32 years of sadhana. So he said, okay, no problem. So it said for 32 more years, he served in the Gurukul, detached from the self, not looking at his reflection, taking care of the cows, serving the ashram. And then, at that time, what was he, was he we can say, like, 
Was he, nowadays we think like, I'll come to the ashram, but how focused will we be? How much of the time are we spending absorbed in material things, checking our news feed, checking what's happening in the world, checking Facebook, checking YouTube, and how much time are we engaged in sadhana and seva? Brahma said, if you really want to understand this, you must get rid of all distractions. So for 32 years he did this. Then after 32 years he came back to Brahma. This is one of the things we can see is that sadhana requires great focus and concentration. Tivrena bhakti yogena, great intensity of practice, if we really want to understand everything. Because just by reading a book, we may get theoretical knowledge. We read and we hear so many different things, but it doesn't become applied knowledge or realized knowledge until we practice it in our lives. So for 32 years he studied, then he came back to Brahma. And then Brahma said, okay, again, in the morning come before me and I will give you the next step of divine knowledge. So he came before Brahma and Brahma said, when you're in the ashram, sometimes you have a dream, right? Sometimes you dream of something. He said, yes. He said, when you dream, you see yourself in the dream. He said, yes. He said, in that dream state, when you see yourself, that is the real Atman. That is the real self. That person you perceive in their dream. And so Indra thought like that and said, okay. And he started leaving. But then as he was getting to the edge of the ashram, he thought, how can that be possible? If I am who I see in the dream, then in a dream, we may be having a nightmare. We may be chased by wild beasts or great ferocious demons and witches. They may even kill us. We may die in our dream, but then we wake up and again, we're present in our physical state and we see we're whole. In a dream, we may be shot and then we wake up and we're alive. So how can that be the self? I remember once when I was a kid, I had a dream that was so real. It might have been like a past life. I don't know. I was in a war, like World War II. I got shot and I died. After I died, I came back to my home as a ghost. And I saw everyone performing my funeral and crying. And I was also very sad. And then anyhow, I decided to move on to the next life. And I woke up in the dream. But when I woke up in reality that morning, it took me one hour to realize I wasn't in a new body. The dream was so real, I woke up and I was like a newborn baby thinking, now I'm in the next life. It was a very intense experience. You know, it was like a past life because it was so real, you know, and I got shot in the dream and it took like two, three hours to die. I was shot in the stomach. And sometimes if you're shot in a certain place in the stomach, it takes like four or five hours to die. And after I died, I became a ghost. Came home and watched the funeral. Everyone crying, oh. And then went to the next body and woke up. And I woke up in my bed and it took me like half an hour, I swear. And then like next week, I was very like, was very strange. So Brahma said, that thing you see in the dream is yourself. But Indra thought, how is it possible? In a dream, I may die or be chased by a tiger and very afraid. And I wake up and I'm not afraid. So Brahma said, yes, this is true. If you want to understand the next, you want to understand the next level, 32 more years. So he said, okay, 32 more years. So 32 more years he did sadhana. So Brahma was teaching him by the indirect method, anvaya vyatareka bhyam. And both are important. First he taught about the body, the physical body is the self. But this is false. Then he taught the subtle body is the self. The subtle body means it's not, it's the uh, linga sadir, stools. There's the gross body and the subtle body. So in the dream, you see the subtle body. It's a projection of the mind, the subconscious. But that's also not the real self. There's something deeper, something more hidden. And we really want to realize it. We have to do strong sadhana. So then for 32 more years, now 96 years had passed. He came back again to Brahma. He said, now please teach me the next level of knowledge. Okay, so Brahma said, what did he say next? He said, okay, you are not what you are when you see your physical body in a reflection. When you look at the reflection, first he said, when you look at a reflection, that eye that you are looking at in the reflection, that eye is the window to the soul. When you look in the mirror, like you put on tilak or you look in the mirror, you see your eye. 
And people say, oh, I can see all the way to your soul through your eyes. So people say the eyes are the windows to the soul. But that's just the gross body. That's called Dehatma Buddhi. And the first real lesson of spiritual life is that I am not this body. That is what was taught by Srila Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada in the West. First, I am not this body. So Indra gave up this knowledge. Then the next, I am the mind or I am subtle consciousness. But then Indra also gave this up. Because that's also temporary. So then Brahma said, beyond the state of wakefulness and beyond the state of dreaming is the state of deep sleep where you even lose the sense of self-awareness. That self who is present in deep dreamless sleep, that is the Atman. Like at night you have a dream, but then some nights you won't dream at all and the whole night will pass like an instant. Or you may have a dream and after that you have dreamless sleep. So he said, when the self is present in dreamless sleep, that is the Atman. Was he right? So he thought about it. He started leaving the ashram. And then again, right at the st edge of the ashram, he came back. He said, oh Brahma, oh Gurudev, please give me something more. So Brahma said, okay. One more time. But this time he made it easy. Five more years. So for five more years he did sadhana and he came back afterwards. It had been 101 years. Long time. And again he approached Brahma. And he said, please teach me about the Atman. So Brahma said, beyond the physical body, beyond the subconscious or the subtle body or the, that perceived self in the dream, beyond the state of the self in dreamless sleep, there is the transcendental self who is separate from the body and who has the potential to enter the spiritual realm and be liberated and have existence there. That divine self is an eternal part and parcel of the Supreme Absolute Truth Bhagavan. Our nature is therefore one with and different from God Himself. This is a chintya beda beda tattva. That we have oneness with God as well as difference with God. Our oneness with God is that we are one in three qualities. Sat, chit, ananda. The soul is eternal. When the body dies, the soul does not perish. Therefore, the soul is not the dream state because the dream state comes and goes, but the soul is eternal. And we have that sameness with God. How God is eternal, we are eternal. How God is full of consciousness, we are full of consciousness. And how God is full of bliss, ananda, we are full of ananda. However, we are different from God because God is vast and we are very small. God is infinite and we are finite. God is like the ocean, we are like a drop in the ocean. God is like the sun, we are like a photon or a particle in the rays of the sun. So therefore, our nature is to have a loving relationship in service to the absolute truth. Because we are his separated part and parcel, to be complete, we need to be in relationship with him. And the process to become in relationship with him is called bhakti yoga. Bhakti yoga is the process to become yukta, connected to Sri Krishna. And our true destiny is to transcend both the subtle and the gross body and go to the absolute world and become liberated. If you become liberated, then the whole world will worship you. At that time, he said, don't go for little pieces of broken glass. Instead, you should go for the most priceless gem, the priceless diamond. And then, what is that? Eternal loving relationship with Sri Krishna. If you achieve that relationship with Krishna, then everything is present within that. Everything is included within that. So that is real knowledge. And that knowledge is given in the Chatusloki Bhagavatam, Achintya Beda Beda Tattva. What is our relationship with Krishna and how can we achieve that relationship with Krishna? How can we strive forward toward that? And if we want to achieve that, what lesson do we learn? We need to take shelter of a guru. We need to perform sadhana. We need to focus and concentrate. We need to detach ourselves from our so-called self. This person that we think we are, I am this is my name, this is where I was born, this is my mother, my father, my sister, my husband, my wife. Unless we start to detach these layers of ignorance, we will not realize the true nature of the self. So that's the first lesson Brahma gave, detach yourself from ignorance. And then you can attach yourself to truth. 
But unless you get detached from the false self, you will not realize the true self. So we have to start to cut through these layers. We're not, this, we're not the mind. We're not the ego. The mind and the ego are also material. So to achieve that true self, to be liberated, we have to follow strong sadhana. Agrahaya mukti, tabe sarva bandha nas, tabe se hoite pare Sri Krishna das. We need mukti from the so-called self. The, the false designation in material life. I am this body, this is my so-called material dharma. I am a lawyer, I am a doctor, this is my duty in life. We need to transcend that and realize I am just Gopi Bhartu Padakamaliyo Dasa Dasa Anu Dasa. Then we can enter that transcendental realm and realize Krishna and the Brijabhasis are my family and everything else is only a fantasy. It's like an hallucination, like a dream that we, the soul is present and trapped in. So we'll stop with this point. It said that the soul trapped in the material body is like an animal who is tied to a cart and pulling the cart here and there. Unless we are freed of that, then we'll continue to be yoked to material life. If you have an animal, you yoke it to a cart. So the body is like this mundane cart and we are carrying it here and there. And through our eyes, we are seeing, through our ears, we are hearing, through this nose, we are smelling. But the nose is not smelling, the ears are not smelling, the eyes are not smelling. It is only the soul. The soul is the witness and the enjoyer of our fruits of our action. And we will suffer and enjoy according to our actions, our karma. The hands will do sin, but the hands will not suffer for our sin. We will suffer. So therefore, we have to become transcendental to the mundane body. And the way to do that is said in one verse. Iha yasya dasya karmana manasagira nikla sapya sartu jivan mukta suchete. We can become liberated even when in this body. If we engage all our senses in Krishna's service, all our endeavors in bhakti yoga, then even while living now, we'll be liberated. And then when we give up this body, we'll go to the transcendental world where we will be happy forever.